Well, well, well. Man, we actually filled this place, didn't we? That's insane. Yes. Off they go. With a very, very slow giant doom slug prime. <laughs> You should go get your picture taken with Doomslug Prime. She's very good at Doomslug noises. <laughs> Hello and thank you for coming to my release party. What I'm going to do tonight is first I'll do a bunch of announcements. We'll do those in a second here. Um, then I am going to do a little speech. If you've ever been to one of these before, you know, you give Professor Sanderson a microphone and he talks. That is what happens. Um, so hopefully the speech is not too dull. Um, after that, we will do a Q&A. Um, and we will be taking questions from the microphones here. I, I want to remind you, a couple things about the questions. Number one, one question per person. Uh, we run into this problem where people come with a big list. One per person. Um, the second thing is, this is a spoiler-free Q&A, all right? We did a spoiler one yesterday, today has to be spoiler-free. And Adam probably has another. Yeah. Uh, I need you to switch to that mic and your cord is hanging right there. My cord, yeah, I know, I can't oh, tuck it in yet. That's the mic going to the stream. Right, so you need. That one should be on still. Do I, do I have to do both of these? Okay, all right, so the stream couldn't hear me, but now they can. Um, so, uh, they don't have to hear about the questions. You guys uh, have to hear about the questions because they're not asking them. But please try to be spoiler free when you ask these questions because there are some people here who haven't read um, any of the books yet. They often are dragged along by uh, family members um, and we would like to keep them from being spoiled for the future books. Um, so let's go into a few of the announcements and mostly, oh, mostly these are going to be uh, people that we need to applaud for because a whole lot of work goes into putting a book together. And I would like to acknowledge that work. Uh, once upon a time, I went down the list of everyone, but my team has gotten very large. So we're going to cheer for each department in turn. <laughs> so uh, the first department that we will cheer for is Peter's department in editorial. Thank you to everyone in editorial. And anyone in each of these departments is uh, welcome to stand up and, uh, and wave when that happens. And so, Isaac in the production department. Yay! Adam and the publicity department. That one's funny because it's only Adam right now. <laughs> but we are hiring him a team. Um, Kara and the store team. Um, and uh, we'll give a separate cheer for the events team for putting this on, even though they're kind of the same people. And then my wonderful wife, Emily, and the facilities team. Uh, and then finally, uh, my agency, Jabberwocky, and my publisher, Random House. They all sent, both sent some people here.
Thank you guys for exercising your hands and uh, uh, giving them some applause. They really deserve it. Uh, my name goes on the books, but as you might see if you uh, read the acknowledgments page, uh, there are quite a lot of names on those pages. We didn't even get to the beta readers and all those who help. So a uh, big thank you to, to all of those folks. I'd also like to thank all the authors and illustrators who came to the convention these last two days. Yeah. And they would like me to note that the dealer's hall is open for an hour after my speech. Um, and uh, it's open to everyone, open to the public. Um, and uh, in particular, you might want to stop by and see Jancy, who wrote the Skyward novellas that we're releasing in conjunction with this book. So if you haven't checked those out, go ask her about those. They're really exciting and fun. I think you'll really like them. So, yeah. So I'm going to dig out the laptop now, get out the big guns, um, and we are going to talk about something because this book that you guys have went through kind of an interesting history. All books do. They have their own stories. Oh, that's magic cards. Nope, not that. <laughs> we want the speech. Some of you would rather that I read magic cards, but we're going we're gonna to do the speech instead. Um, so, I don't know about you guys, but for myself and a lot of my friends and people I know, these last couple years have been a little extra hard, right? Um, for a lot of people, for a lot of different reasons. And I didn't think it was affecting me, um, at least not in the same way as everyone else, right? I, uh, things tend to roll off of me. I tend to be a fairly low-stress individual, um, and so I didn't really think that, um, that the, the pandemic and everything was affecting me. But this book, Cytonic, is one of the hardest books in my career to produce. It has been one of the hardest books in my career to produce. Um, and I didn't know how much of a challenge it would be at first. Um, before the pandemic started, um, right, actually right around when it was starting, I finished it off and sent it to my publisher. And when you finish a book, at least when I finish a book, I'm always very uh, optimistic about how awesome it is, right? I'm always like, oh, this is the one that's going to be a super easy revision, right? Because this one just is great. Nothing's wrong with this book. And I sent it off feeling all that it would be easy and good. And I wasn't expecting this to be the hard book, um, one of the hardest of my career. Um, the response came back, this is um, from my publisher at this point, and it was starting to come in from my alpha readers, which are my writing group. Um, and the response that I got was, eh, uh, which is not what you want, if you were wondering, right? <laughs> that, that is not, like, in many ways you would rather have people be like, ah, oh, it was awful, then, eh. um, because at least if it was awful, you were inspiring strong emotions, right? <laughs> um, you know, it's, uh, it's like, what, is it Paul that says, don't be lukewarm, right? That's that, you don't want lukewarm art. Well, some art people want to be lukewarm, but I don't want lukewarm art. And so, um, here I is, I'm thinking this book is, is great and fine, and <sighs> then I got this kind of, <sighs> and I talked to my editor, I called my editor Krista, and we had this conversation, and she was dancing around a topic. She never said it. My agent did um, later on, because that's Joshua. Uh, you guys have heard me talk about Joshua. Um, but she's dancing around it, and the air I got from her was this kind of, I think I just read a bad Sanderson book, and I don't know how to react. Um, which, on one hand, is very flattering, because that means she hasn't read one before. Um, and I have. I, I try very hard to keep you from ever doing that. Um, but I called my agent, and I said, it sounds like she doesn't like the book. And he's like, well, guess what? Book's not very good. Uh, <laughs> Chris is from California. Joshua's from New York. This is how the different coasts sometimes act. Um, yeah. Um, and 
I'm like, oh, great. It's going to be one of the hard ones. Because this hasn't, you know, I do, I do end up with things that need revision in other books. I'm like, this is going to be one of the hard ones. Um, hard parts of writing. Everyone has different parts of their lives and of, uh, of writing, if you're writers, that are hard. Uh, for me, one of the hardest parts in all of my career was actually sharing my books for the first time. I don't know if uh, other people have this, um, but there's this strange sense, right? Before you write a book, when you're just imagining it in your head, it is perfect. It's this beautiful thing, right? Um, and you, you imagine that, you know, you found the great American novel. You, once you put it to page, the page is going to sing, right? You'll touch it, and rays of light will come off, like, you know, you're in the Rats of Nim or something, right? And it's just like, um, and you, you'll be have, you know, this wonderful, beautiful thing. Um, and then you start to write. And uh, for a lot of us, one of two things happens. Either, this is usually, um, you know, if you start writing for the first time when you're a little older, either you recognize immediately that it's terrible, or you pretend for a while. <laughs> um, and what's going on here is if you recognize it's terrible, I, I meet a lot of, uh, of newer writers, that it's really hard for them because in their head this thing was perfect. And then they start writing it, and it's like they have sullied it, right? They've taken something perfect in their imagination, and they have ruined it by making it so awful with their skills. Um, for, for me, that wasn't the case, right? Or I should say their lack of skills. For me, I was able to pretend that my writing was great as long as I didn't show it to someone who told me otherwise, right? <laughs> so when I was in high school and I started writing my first few books, I hid my manuscripts behind the picture in my room. It would hung um, on my wall because my mom forced me to have like paintings and things. She came up and made me decorate. If I, you know, I was a teenager, I would just staple posters to the wall, right? Um, and I would hide. I'd hide the manuscripts back there, terrified that anyone would find them because if they did, they might tell me that something is wrong with the manuscript. Um, this can be really hard for writers. I'm, I'm making kind of light of it, but it's, it's a very serious thing. This having to acknowledge that what you've made isn't perfect. It's like, um, it's like you don't want to admit that maybe, you know, your baby might be ugly. Because <laughs> no babies are ugly, except for the fact that all of them are. <laughs> Every ba baby either looks like Winston Churchill or Patrick Stewart, right? And then there's a Smeagol in there once in a while. <laughs> um, my wife hates it when I talk like that. But at least with your, your manuscript, you're going to have to admit that there are big flaws with it at some point, And that can be soul crushing. Um, and it's really hard. Uh, the first time I had to do this, um, I shared a book with Greg Creer. Um, some of my friends might know Greg. Um, he was a friend from my missionary service in Korea. We were both going to BYU, and we were both in classes in Korean uh, classes at the time. And by then, I'd begun to make friends in the writing community. I'd begun going to the, the writing magazine on campus where, uh, not writing, but the science fiction magazine where we would take submissions, and you know, everyone there was a writer, but we were all kind of editing. And I didn't tell them that I wrote books. They didn't know. Um, but I told my friend for my Korean class, he actually saw me with a manuscript, he's like, hey, what's that? I'm like, uh, you know, it's a, it's a thing I'm working on. He's like, oh, hey, can I read it? And suddenly, crisis moment, <laughs> right? But then my brain said, wait, he doesn't know my other friends. <laughs> if he hates it, he's like, he's like quarantined in the Korean department. <laughs> he's going to be a lawyer. Nobody talks to them. <laughs> so it's okay, maybe if he hates it, no one else will find out that I'm a terrible failed author. Um, and so I gave Greg uh, the story. And man, it was, it was really hard. Um, and it was even more hard when I got the feedback back. Because of course the book wasn't perfect. Um, Greg was really good at giving the feedback. He's like, hey, here's some things I like, and here's some parts that I didn't like. Translation, this whole thing was boring and terrible. 
Um, but I'm a good friend, so I'm not going to tell you that. I'm going to inspire you. Um, and um, I had to confront this for the first time. I had to confront the idea that maybe my book wasn't great. And at that moment, everything kind of came crashing down, right? Suddenly, this thing that I've been pretending to do for a long time, um, pretending I was a writer, I had to like have this crisis moment of, am I actually going to go do this? Because I kind of want millions of people to read my books. I'm going to have to get used to the idea of people actually seeing them. I've written like four, at that point, novels, and I was not sharing them with people. Um, but I kept telling myself, I will share them with people when they're ready. And that's kind of the, the problem here. There's just this quote by Hugh Laurie that I like. Um, and uh, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read it to you. Um, it's a terrible thing, I think, in life to wait until you're ready. I have this feeling now that actually no one is ever ready to do anything. There's almost no such thing as ready. There's only now, and you may as well do it now. Um, I've always loved that quote ever since I read it, because um, can we be ready? That's the big question that kind of comes to me. Like, can we be ready? For me, what I was having to get ready for was the idea that my books were not great, and I was going to have to learn how to make them great. You see, during that era of my career, I've told you this story before, I won't go too much into it, but I would always be like, I don't want to fix this book, I want to write a new book. I'm always excited about the next thing. You guys can probably tell that about me, right? I'm always thinking of, ooh, what's the cool new thing that I want to write? Um, and if I, my books were not perfect, then the right thing for me to do was learn how to revise them, and that sounded really hard, right? I did not want to do the hard thing to become a writer. I wanted to do the things that came naturally and easily to me. So let's talk about video games. How's that for a segue? Ah. This will relate, I promise. This will all, this, this, this will mean something. Um, one of my favorite genres of video games is roguelikes. Do you guys know what these are? Yeah. yeah. So if you don't know what roguelikes are, um, they started with uh, a generation of video games back in the dinosaur eras, era of like the late 70s and early 80s, uh, when video games Computers could not render graphics, but people wanted to pretend to have these awesome uh, high graphic games anyway. So they would make video games where like they would use the symbol characters as like the graphics, right? So you'd have like a dungeon and the dungeon wall was like uh, pound signs, right? And they'd have like little question marks. And then like you are like an exclamation point moving along, right? It couldn't draw graphics, but it could draw letters and symbols. So they just made huge dungeons out of these. Um, and a game Rogue, and some like it, um, were these games that were extremely difficult because it was the 80s and gaming was like that. Um, and they were randomized. And they'd go on this adventure, and if your character died, that was it. There's no continues. There's no, you know, you just start over at the beginning with a new randomized dungeon, and, and you just have to do better next time, right? Well, over the years, video games have had a lot of adaptations and a lot of advancements, and one of them is realizing not everyone wants to play a game that is enormously difficultly, uh, has enormous difficulty and is hugely punishing, right? We've gotten much better at realizing maybe video games should be fun. Um, <laughs> And so it's totally okay if you don't like the style of game. In fact, the style of game can be, like I said, extremely punishing. Um, but as video games have advanced, people have continued to go back to these old things we called roguelikes. In fact, they're having a renaissance right now. Um, one of my favorite games last year was Hades. Uh, it's the character I dressed up as, right? Um, it's a really fantastic game. Uh, it does a lot to accommodate people who maybe don't want like this style of game um, and, and, and kind of act as an ambassador to those who haven't tried it. But also, it was really fun for someone like me who was a big fan of this style of game. But, you know, I've played a lot of them. Spelunky, FTL, um, all of these things, all of these kind of what we call roguelite is the new, uh, the new term we use for them. Um, and I love these games. And thinking about it, I wondered why. Why do I love these games? Why do I love Dark Souls, which is another very punishing game series, right? Um, and I realized that most games have some sort of level up mechanism. 
And this is good. What this allows you to do, if you don't game, it just means that you go do something kind of tedious in the game, and your character gets stronger, right? So, you know, you go do something like step on rats, and eventually you'll be strong enough to step on a dragon. That's how video game logic works. Uh, don't ask questions. Um, <laughs> but it's actually kind of nice, because, you know, I couldn't slay a dragon if I had to. Um, I know some people, if Scar's here, he probably could, um, but, you know, most people I know could never slay a dragon. But in video games, part of the fun is doing things you couldn't normally do. Um, but one of the things I noticed about these roguelikes that I was playing is they have very different level up mechanics. Some don't have any at all. Um, uh, some of them do, but they're very slow progressions and kind of behind the scenes progressions. And really, these games are about forcing you to do the hard parts of the game, right? Um, in this other game with le leveling up, if you don't want to do the hard thing of fighting the dragon, you go do something e easy but tedious long enough to turn the fighting dragon thing into something easy but tedious. And then before long, you're stomping 100 dragons in order to kill, you know, uh, Cthulhu or something. Um, but in these other games, you don't, the character doesn't level up in the same way. So you have to do the hard parts of the game, and you level up, right? That's what those games are about. It's kind of one of the distinctions. And there's no better or worse. I actually like both styles of games. But these ones make you do the hard parts. And kind of my speech today is about the hard parts, about forcing ourselves to do the hard parts, because we can't always go step on some critter until the, uh, the hard parts become easy. Um, really, in life, a lot of time, doing the hard parts is the only way to get good at the hard part, right? Which is that catch-22, right? I did not want to learn to revise, but as long as I was not willing to revise, I couldn't learn how to revise. The only thing that would teach that to me was doing the hard part. Um, and, man, that's kind of a kind of a kick in the stomach, because writing is supposed to be just this fun, easy thing, right? Well, no, I wanted to make it my profession. I really did. Um, and over those years that I started, uh, I started to realize what was happening to me. I started to realize that I was always looking to the next book. I started getting good at getting feedback. I started sharing my books around. It was really fun. I'd print off a manuscript, I would hand it to one friend, and like six months later, it'd come back and it'd gone through like, you know, 13 or 14 people, uh, most of whom I didn't know, and they'd all written comments on my book. Uh, it was good practice for, I don't know, YouTube comments or whatever. Um, <laughs> actually, nothing can prepare you for that, but... Um, uh, it, was, it was really this fun thing, and I would then take those manuscripts, and I would read the feedback, and my brain kept wanting to say, oh, look at all these things you did wrong. Just don't do those next time, and the book will be perfect again, and your baby will be pretty. Um, <laughs> your baby will be cute instead of Smeagol. Uh, and so I would go write another book. Now, this had, uh, in some ways, uh, some beneficial aspects. I've talked about this before. I wrote 13 novels before I sold one, and all of these books that I was writing taught me to uh, get really excited about new worlds, new settings. I built the idea of the Cosmere in a connected universe because I was always writing new books. Um, but what I wasn't practicing was the hard part. Let's go back to Cytonic. Um, so I knew that I had to do the hard part. By now, I have figured it out, and I feel like I've gotten decently good at doing the hard part. Uh, so, I buckled down early 2020, and I said, I'm going to fix this thing. And I did some really hardcore revisions. Um, I, you know, I did what I, you know, what I normally do, and I sent the book to my beta readers, and the response came back, eh, again, uh, maybe with a, a more of a mix of, I don't think I like this. Uh, so, they maybe liked it less. Um, so that's where this being the, one of the hardest books I've done came from. And I think one of the issues I later on found out is it was related to the pandemic. Not in the same way you might be thinking. 
Um, I normally go to the gym every morning. No, I don't look at like it, but I'd be worse if I didn't. Um, I go to the gym every morning before I write and spend about 40 minutes on the elliptical machine listening to music and preparing the scenes I'm going to write. When the pandemic happened, the gym closed. And I wasn't able to do that um, for this book. And I realized, even though things just kind of wash over me, the pandemic was still hitting me in a really hard way because my writing just, I hadn't had that pre-writing preparatory time or that time to work on problems in my head that I normally got during revisions. Um, and I had, to, I had to institute that in a different way in order to make the process work. But man, you talk about it, uh, it hurting. Like, um, I did a lot of work on that, uh, that draft I sent to the beta readers, and to have it come back even kind of slightly worse after all of that work, that's when I wanted to give up on this book. But here's the thing. I had just done that, Right? The Apocalypse Guard, I'd done it, done a revision, gotten it back, sent it to people. They hadn't liked it, and I, 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 I set the book aside and wrote Skyward. And one of the things that I found is if you find a way to avoid the hard part, you want to make that a theme, right? We're very good at making habits as human beings, or at least we're very good at keeping them. Kind of hard at making, uh, for us to make them, but easy habits, we're very good at making. Um, and I realized if I put this book aside, number one, um, yes, maybe it would be easier. In fact, I know it would be easier to sit down and write a completely different book with a completely different outline. But it wouldn't then make good on the, all the foreshadowing I put into the first two books. And plus, who knows if I need to revise that one, right? The first draft is usually the easiest part for me. Um, and I needed to kind of... <laughs> Hugh Laureate, um, and just be like, I know, I, I can't just sit on this book forever. I need to actually write this book. I need to actually do this book. Um, why is it so hard for us to do the hard part, right? Um, that's one of the things I've been thinking about these last years. Like, obviously, it's hard. Uh, duh, Brandon. But at the same time, we all know it, right? We all know that we'll feel better if we do the hard part. We all know that we will learn more if we do the hard part. I'm not teaching you anything here. You're like, oh, big surprise, Brandon. Hard things are good for us. Uh, good speech. Clap, clap, clap. Um, uh, you don't need to do that. I was joking. <laughs> um, um, but I look back at what made me finally do the hard part uh, in my career. During those early books, uh, what made me change? And it was the realization, the realization that um, it was going to be harder for me if I didn't do the hard part, right? If I didn't learn to revise, then I was going to have to go be a lawyer or something. <laughs> uh, apologies to the attorneys. I actually, I employ many attorneys. They're, they're very helpful. Um, I, I love you all. I'm contractually obligated to say that. Otherwise, they'll sue me. <laughs> um, uh, but no, I realized that in the long run, if you don't do the hard part now, the, harder, the parts get, easy, get harder in the future. Does that make any sense? Um, I was going to have to, if I didn't buckle down and learn to do the hard part of writing, I would have to do something else with my life other than tell my stories. And that was the truly hard thing to imagine for myself. And so I started. I started doing revisions. And let me tell you, I still hate revisions. <laughs> This is my least favorite part, right? This is the part where you have to admit that uh, this metaphor is getting worse and worse. Your, your baby needs plastic surgery? <laughs> Let's pretend I didn't go there. Um, um, but this is, you know, this is the part that's like a, like a kick to the face. I talked to Peter, who's uh, head of my editorial department, and he, um, I, he, I'll be like, Peter, just make sure um, to understand that when I'm doing revisions, I am taking criticism every day about my baby. And he's like, okay, he's very nice uh, the way he writes things in revisions because he understands this is, this is really hard. It's emotionally hard, but it's also just like I want to be writing the new thing. I don't want to be sitting here and working on this thing I already wrote. Uh, who cares about that? Um, but... It's no um, coincidence that the book I sat down and decided, decided to fix and did four solid revisions on was Elantris, the one that eventually sold. 
Um, and I often say, like people ask me, they're like, what's the one thing that you wish as a new writer you would have learned sooner? And I think learning to force yourself, myself, to do the hard part of writing, learning to do revision earlier, I think that's the one key that if I would have learned that earlier, it w I wouldn't have taken 13 novels before I sold one. Because once I learned it, it is actually really, really satisfying a skill to know as a writer. Um, with Cytonic, I said, all right, I'm going to do this again. This is going to be one of the hardest ones because I have to do it yet again. But I built, kind of tore it down back to its foundation of the things I wanted from the book. And I rebuilt it entirely. Um, one of the hardest revisions I've ever done. And then we did another beta read with different readers. And this time, finally, people liked it. Um, this time I got feedback of, wow, this is really great. This might be my favorite one. Um, there was even a piece of feedback that was, uh, that was along the lines of, it seems like this was so easy for you. Uh, this was just a fun, light adventure. And I'm like, oh, finally. Um, <laughs> right? Uh, it, 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 it takes all this work to make it look easy. Um, but I guess uh, the, the point of this all is not, oh, Brandon's awesome. Um, the point of this is, uh, this last couple of years, it's kind of forced us all to do the hard part, right, of our lives. Um, for a lot of us, you know, we haven't been left with any choice, but we've done it, right? Like these, these last years, I think kind of prove, you know, if there are things that are hard in your life, you can do them. We can do them. Um, if there are things that aren't working, we can fix them. We can make it work. It can happen. And if we do it, then we get to do things like this and let everybody read my book and hopefully love it. So thank you guys for coming to the release party.